good to see you. It's good to see you. Let's talk with the Lord. Heavenly Father, again, Lord, it's always a privilege and a joy to share your word, and I'm glad I'm able to do that today. Thank you for that privilege I have of serving you in this way. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. There's not a lot of scripture verses today. Uh, not like some messages, but uh, 1 Corinthians 3.1 is the one that Paul spoke of saying, I came to feed you with meat, but I had to give you milk because you weren't ready to receive it. And uh, Psalms 119.11, Isaiah 40, verse 8, and Titus, of course, we read. So those are the only scriptures involved today. But I was beginning to say that uh, uh, I want to talk about our culture. Now, last week, we had a 4th of July service, of which I can tell you I was proud to be an American, and I'm proud to be a Christian. And uh, there's no better place that I think in this place in the, in the earth to live than in America. Why do you suppose all these people want to come to America? Why do you suppose that is? Well, yes, yeah, some do. But America is a place of freedom. Freedoms are starting to be eroded. I want to talk about some of this erosion that's taken place in America. Begins with our culture. If you recall, and some of you are too young to recall, but in the 50s and 60s, uh, more people were more friendly with Christians than they are today. A lot of tent revivals. I attended tent revivals. I was in tent revivals. We had tent revivals. We had, there was a lot of things going on with Christianity back then. You'll find we had more inventions during that period of time than any other period of history. Because God blessed. When you, when you respect and honor God, God blesses the nation. When you, when you forget and try to get rid of God, look out. And that's what we're trying to do today. We're trying to get rid of God. And when that happens, God turns his back on the nation. He turns his back on the nation. And we're witnessing some of that. But we've gotten some, some good results with the Supreme Court. Uh, overturning it. The devil is mad. The protesters are on the streets because the devil is mad. They claim it's their body. It's not their body. They don't own their body. That's just nonsense. They don't own their body. Our bodies were all bought by the precious blood of Jesus Christ. You don't own your body. I don't own my body today. This body is the temple of the Lord. And I need to glorify him with my temple. So your body does not belong to you. Don't, pull, don't, don't hold signs that your body belongs to you because it doesn't. That's nothing but a lie from hell. The devil told you that. You didn't see that in God's word. The devil told you that your body is yours. Your body is not yours. It was bought with the precious blood of our Lord. So we have to learn in a world that's opposed to many of our beliefs, to our values, and our lifestyles. And we got to be careful that we're not overcome by it. It's what happened to the church you see in Corinth. They became compromised with the culture that was around them. You see, the culture began to affect them. And the culture has already affected many of us. You don't realize how much the culture has already affected us. But I can tell you this. I never thought I'd live to see the day when Christians would vote for abortion. I never thought I'd live to see that. But it's here. And, it's, and among some, it's perfectly okay. Well, it's not okay. God's word says it's murder. That's what it is. God hates it. He hates the shedding of innocent blood, if you want the scriptural term. He hates the shedding of innocent blood. And he said, their blood cries to me. When Cain slew Abel, God said, where is your brother? He said, am I my brother's keeper? The Lord said, your brother's blood 
cries to me from the ground. What do you think is crying to our Lord every time a baby is slain? Huh? You see how the culture has already affected many of us? Our thinking, our values, our lifestyles. Many believers have committed their lives to Christ. They're growing spiritually. They're dependent on the Holy Spirit. They're obedient. And they're trusting in the Lord every day. However, there are others who are lustful, immature, because they've already been compromised with the culture and have adopted its ideas and its values and its practices. Already have adopted it. I see it very clearly. It's a shame. What do you think your parents would think if they were still here with us? I know what my grandpa would think, oh, brother. When him and my Uncle Abe got together, it was wildfire. They talked a lot about spiritual things. And I'm telling you, they'd have a lot to talk about today. Are we concerned? Well, you should be. Do you have any grandkids? Do you have any children? You should be. Too sad today that unless it affects me, I don't worry about it. Oh, really? <laughs> okay. Find out, Lord, whatever affects them. Go for it. When Paul left Crete, he wrote a letter to instruct Titus, who was the local pastor, to instruct him. Paul told Titus he needed to appoint elders in the churches who hold firmly and faithful to the word. To the word of God, of course, he is referring to. Hold fast to the faithful word. You see, that's the key to living in this corrupt world so that we don't become conformed or we don't compromise with it. Because our society is very secular. It's dominated by materialism. Why is it, it seems like whoever gets the most is how they finish gets the most. Well, guess what? When you draw your last breath, you're going to let the most right behind you. Everything you have lived to accumulate in your lifetime, you're going to let behind all of it. You're not taking a nickel with you. It won't matter if somebody writes you a check and they're out of your bank account and puts it in your pocket in the casket. You're not going to cash it in heaven. (laughs) Or the other place you go. We don't talk much about that place today. We like to talk about heaven. But people don't realize sometimes the choices they make will send them right to hell. The choice they make. The lifestyle they chose. The danger you see that we face is that subtle influence of our culture. You see, it seeps into our minds through many ways. Through the media. What are you listening to? I can always tell what news people are listening to. All I've got to do is hear them. Just let me listen to you for a little bit. Oh, you listen to fake news. I can tell. I can tell if you're listening to fake news or not. Just let me talk to you for a little bit. I know exactly what fake news is talking about because I listen to that once in a while to hear the junk they talk about. It's junk. It's exactly what it is. It's fake news. Why do you think they call it fake news? Because some people like to be lied to. Oh, they like to be lied to. Tell me good things. Don't tell me the truth. Just tell me nice things. I don't know, did you read the scriptures? Isn't that what they said? Speak, prophesy to me. Nice things. Say nice things to me. I like nice things. Don't talk about the lamentations of Jeremiah. Cut that out of your Bible because I don't like that. Why should we hold firmly to God's word? Well, I want to talk about the Bible. 
The Bible is very unique. You see, God is the author of it. His Holy Spirit works through men, and as the Holy Spirit worked through men, they recorded God's thoughts. They put it in written form, which you have on your lap this morning. I'm grateful for God's word. The scriptures reveal God to us. The Bible reveals his power, his works, his character, his truth, the plan of redemption, and he has given instructions for all of us to live by. And if you live according to his instructions, you'll live. If you try to get rid of God's word, look out. The earth will be filled with violence. What are we seeing today? Violence in many of our cities. It's okay. It's okay. Let everybody know how you feel. That's what they say. They push it. They, they, they keep pushing it. The Bible says the earth was filled with violence in Noah's day, much like it is today. Violence, violence, violence. Do away with God. Kick them out of our schools. The only thing we did back in our day was chew gum and had to put it in our nose. We didn't have stabbings. We didn't have shootings. We didn't have anybody, everybody slaughtered. We didn't have blood running in the classrooms and the hallways. And folks, today they think it's okay. Let's kick God out and have shootings every day. Hello. <laughs> How's that working out for you? That's what I thought. Not working out very well, is it? Whew, I was just talking about the schools. I could spend all morning and talk about some other things. A lot of things happening in our churches. I could give you some information about that too. You'd be surprised how many pastors are taking their flocks out of the organization. You see, I'm a bishop of our ministerium, so that's what we've been dealing with the last few weeks. We've been dealing with pastors who are wanting to take their congregations out of the main denominations so they can be licensed with our ministerial organization. You'd be amazed at how many pastors are wanting to leave and take their congregation. One particular pastor, do you know what's going to cost them to leave? $300,000. Oh, that's, that's just what they got to pay to get their church. You understand that, don't you, Bob? That's what you got to pay to buy your church back. Do you know what? The other pastors, they can't afford to do it, so they're stuck. They can't afford that kind of money. They don't have large enough congregations. They can't leave. They're stuck. Do you know there's two gay bishops already in a, in a denomination that I'm not going to mention? But you should know who the organization is, and so should you. Two gay bishops. That's just the beginning, folks. We're getting ready for the tribulation period. That's coming. That's coming. This is the day and age we're living. This is our culture. You see, the Bible is the foundation of our beliefs. It is truth. We don't live by opinions, but by the principles of God's word. It shapes and conducts our conversations and, and forms our characters, what makes us who we are. The scriptures are eternal. Human beings, like philosophies and ideas, will be like the grass that withers and the flowers that fade. But the word of our God stands forever, Isaiah 40 and verse 8. The Bible says heaven and earth will pass away, but God's word will never pass away. So devil, you got notice, God's word you're not going to touch. You can make all the noise and intimidation you want, but you'll never touch God's word because it is eternal. So fight and holler all you want, devil. We rebuke you in the name of Jesus. The culture says that the Bible is outdated. It is inadequate for our times. 
But I can tell you the Bible is more up to date than the morning newspaper. It has more to say about the future than anybody in this world. Because it has, because he holds the future in his hands. He knows the end from the beginning. Some people even think it's a hate book because they don't want to be convinced that their lifestyle is sinful. They don't want to be convicted of it. They don't want to be told that their lifestyle is sinful. Well, we think of these certain lifestyles are sinful, but I can tell you if, if you're married man and cheating on your wife or your wife's cheating on you, that's a sinful lifestyle and it's just as bad as the other lifestyles. You listening to me? It's just as bad. There's not a stone throw difference. God says it's sin. I don't care what Hollywood calls it. God calls it sin. God's word will never change. A lot of things happen in our culture, but God's word never changes. So I can be accused of hate speech, you know. Eventually, they might be able to close the church up because of your hate speech. Do you know that? They're passing laws so they can do that. Right under your nose, they're passing them. So the day can come, they can, they can shut you down if you say anything about somebody's lifestyle. It's considered hate speech. Let me tell you something. No matter who you are, and if you're listening by way of internet today, no matter what kind of a lifestyle you're in, let me tell you something. I love every one of you, but I hate your lifestyle. But I love you, and God loves you. But he hates your lifestyle. So do something about it. You can change. You can change. You can do something about it. And don't you listen to the devil. Don't you listen to him. He's a liar. He'll tell you your lifestyle's okay. It's not okay. Because God hates it. God hates these lifestyles that are sinful. He loves you, but he hates your lifestyle. You made some wrong choices along the way. So ask God to forgive you. He loves you. He'll forgive you. But you've got to make some changes. No matter how much God's word is reviled or attacked, it cannot be destroyed. The Lord has preserved it throughout human history because it is his eternal word. The purpose of God's word is the Lord gave us his word so that we could be saved. The gospel is his plan of salvation through his son Jesus Christ and it tells us how we can receive forgiveness of sins through faith and be reconciled with our creator. God's word's been given so we can live godly lives. So we can be transformed by his word. But it can't happen if we only hang on to God's word very loosely. We need to cling to God's word fully and firmly. So it can change us. The Lord gives us the scriptures so we can understand the truth and be able to defend it, our faith. So we've seen the purpose of God's word. Let's look at the power of God's word. The Lord is almighty. His word is almighty. It has the power to change your life. Steve, you've seen it, first place in prison. You saw it, God's power to change men's lives. You've seen it firsthand. Power to change your lives, to help us to live as God desires. The power of God's word provides us hope and help during hardships. 
It gives us guidance and wisdom. It lifts our burdens. We come here and we share with one another. We pray with one another. We lay hands on one another. It helps to lift our burdens. We care for one another. We love one another. By this shall all men know you, you are my disciples, by the love that you have for one another. It brings us joy and peace and confidence and courage. It keeps us from sin. I have treasured your word in my heart so that I may not sin against you. Psalms 119 and verse 11, David shared that. It brings us back to God when we stray. It equips us to identify and refute errors so that we can guard ourselves from the false doctrines and ideas that seem to be so prevalent in our culture today. It gives us assurance. It equips us to serve God in many ways. God's word is our anchor for a corrupt culture. Anybody know what an anchor is? Who knows what an anchor is? How many, do we have anybody that ever fished? Anybody fish? Did you ever throw an anchor out? I threw an anchor out, got caught in the law. We had a way to get that thing out there. But it, what does an anchor do, anybody? Just answer me. What does an anchor do? It holds you. You see, God's word holds us steadfast. It's an anchor. We need an anchor today in this corrupt culture. We need an anchor. So we're not drifting away from God. Many people have been drifting from God. Pastors are drifting from God. They don't even know what the truth of God says anymore. They tiptoe through the tulips, it's sad to me. Pastors are afraid to speak the truth. They're afraid they might get voted out. Good for you. Go deliver newspapers. Get somebody saved on the newspaper route if that's a problem. Shame on you. If you're afraid to speak God's word, get out of the pulpit and let somebody in that's, that can handle it. I have no pity on pastors that tiptoe through the toilets. Shame on you. No wonder our nation's in the shape it's in. No wonder Christians don't know how to vote. Hello? It's about time somebody starts preaching the truth. People need to know what the truth is. God's word's an anchor, folks, for our corrupt culture. The world does its best. They try to drag us away from the Lord. But I can tell you the world can't steal my salvation. It can deceive us and it can tempt us to go from our anchor. But that's why we have to be diligent and hold fast to God's word. We have to have an unwavering faith. Doubts regarding the truth of God's word usually arise when we dismiss the verses and passages that forbid what we want to do. You know, they're trying to rewrite the Bible. Did you know that? They're trying to rewrite it to make it sound the way they want it to sound, to adjust to their lifestyles. They want to rewrite it. God's word doesn't need to be rewritten. It needs to be obeyed. Period. Don't need to be rewritten. They want to rewrite it. Make it sound better. They don't like the commandments because they don't want to follow them. Before long, we're going to just rewrite the whole thing. We'll just hold on to those parts we find acceptable and those things that we can rationalize away all the rest. Just pick the things that we like. That's pretty sad, but that's the way it is today. Applying the scripture to our lives. Let's apply the Bible to our lives. It isn't just the foundation. It's a message for us. It's a message in our hearts and in our minds and on our lips and before our eyes. If we want to be pure and have pure lives, we must fill our minds with the purity of God's word. Every decision we should be making should be guided by biblical principles. Not affected or compromised by our culture. And so what are some of the ways, I'm finishing with this now, what are some of the ways we can hold firmly to his word? Well, we can read it carefully. We can meditate on it daily. We can study it seriously. We can believe it wholeheartedly. We can obey it consistently. We can apply it personally. And we can share it confidently. 
not ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ. It's the power of God and the salvation to everyone that believeth. Don't be ashamed to share his word. Look what it's done in your life. I am so grateful. I want you to be grateful. I want to share it with you. Share it with others who don't have hope. Share it with them. They need hope. A lot of people have no hope today. Share it with them. So what happens if we don't cling to the scriptures? Well, then the culture gets our attention. Other things begin to influence us. The world wins our affections. Our focus is redirected from the Lord to the culture. The topics of culture dominate our conversation. The world influences the way we dress. Our choice of music is influenced. The culture steals the money that we once gave to the Lord's work. We alter agendas to make time for worldly pursuits. We fill our minds with sensual and immoral thoughts. Our witness becomes ruined. And lastly, we're led into idolatry. That's where you're headed when you forsake God. It's idolatry. To worship those things that you'd rather worship than God. The tragedy for believers who compromise with the world is even though their souls may be saved, their lives have been wasted. The only solution is to repent. Turn away from the culture and back to the Lord and his word. Every head bowed, every eye closed. What influences you more? Does the Bible or does the culture influence you? Do you accept things today as normal? Or can you see how corrupt the culture has become? How has it changed during your lifetime? I can tell you I've never thought I'd see the things happening today that's happening. And my heart aches for my children and my grandchildren. What effect is the media having on your thoughts, on your attitudes and emotions and things that you practice? How much does it occupy your time and focus compared to with God's word? Pastor, I think this message is for me today. Pray for me. I'll slip my hand up. Pray for me. I do need some help in that area. There's a hand. There's another hand. Another one. Oh, my. I'm putting mine up, too, with you. Just about everybody here put their hand up. You know how happy that makes God. That means God can do something with you because he loves you. And he wants you to be concerned about it. And that makes him very happy. Father in heaven, thank you for this. Thank you for this family today. Almost everyone here, I think, put their hand up that this message has affected them. It affected me. I concern about getting too close to things. Lord, when there was a time when I was so involved in, in politics that I spent more time following politics than I followed you. And so, Lord, I ask you to forgive me. Because I should have been spending more time with you and the word instead of worried about politics. So, Lord, I needed this too. I needed this message today too and Lord I want to pray for every one of these hands that went up today I'm so grateful that this message you put on my heart and I shared it and Lord I want to pray for these who will be listening or watching maybe by way of the internet I understand my wife says there's quite a few followers so I pray for every one of you that have tuned into this message today I want to pray for you especially and your families Maybe you're not able to be in the church today with these people as I am, but I pray for you and your family. I pray that right now that you'll ask God to forgive you and repent of some of the things in your life, the way the culture has affected you and your thoughts and your actions and the places you go. And I pray that God will help you to make the right decisions and he will lead and guide you closer to him than you've ever been. Thank you for each and every one of you who 
who have listened to this message today and these that are in my congregation today, thank you for your hands that were raised. I pray that the Holy Spirit will empower you and strengthen you to live a wonderful and godly life all the days and years that God will, will allow you to, to live on this earth. In the wonderful name of Jesus, we pray. And everybody said, amen. Lord bless you.